Good evening to the saints of God and all of our visiting friends and those that are joining us online as well. Tonight, we want to continue our discussion as relates to Judgment Day. This is lesson number four. Our lesson text, as was stated this morning and read in your hearing tonight, just rereading for emphasis sake, the Hebrew writer records, and as it is appointed, as it is appointed, there is a, there's a definitive date, time, place. We're going to taste physical death. We don't know when, but we will. We use the example of uh, an expiration date on medicine, expiration date, uh, spoiling date, if you will, on milk. Uh, you have perishable items. Perish means to die. So we, we purchase perishable items. That shelf life is not forever. As we said this morning, I had some folks thank me from a grocery standpoint. So you those in the front of those that are closest to the expiration date. If they don't sell that by that expiration date, they got to throw it away. So they're going to give it to you, buy one, get one free, and everything else. So it's called marketing one-on-one. So they get you to buy it, but you need to check that date because you buy two of them, you're probably going to use one. But nevertheless, and as it is appointed unto man, wants to die. But after this, the judgment recognizes the sequential nature of what God has put in order. Mankind is born. We're born into this world, born into this light. One day, there's an appointment, and you will be on time for this one. You may be habitually late to everything in your life. You're going to be on time one time. You ain't going to miss this. We're not going to miss this. And after sequencing order, after we physically die, we all must face the judgment. We discussed this morning the impact of sin. We discussed this morning, will a loving God punish us? We began that deep dive. And when we talk about punishment, we must understand and study and teach and preach the reality of hell. And so as we talk about the impact of sin, just reinforcing a, a basic thought from this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse number 8, we need to recognize, you know, we understand from this morning a law and from these series of lessons, a law is a standard of conduct, a standard of behavior. You, this is what you have. This is what you are to do. Don't violate this standard. But laws are written for the lawless. Laws not written for law abiding citizens. You don't have to worry about that. They're going to do what they need to do. Again, when you're a teacher in school and you put up all the things you need to do, that's those bad kids. Let me rephrase that. Those kids who act badly. There's no you, you understand what I mean, but I want to still clarify that you put rule up. You will take your seat. You will turn your homework. You will raise your hand. You put up all these rules or expert expectations. That's not for the child that's going to be right there doing everything you need to do. You don't have to worry about them. You got to remind those that are lawless about the classroom rules and behaviors. If you, if you are an educator, you understand what I'm talking about. If you've been around kids, you know what I'm talking about. It's You don't worry about the, yeah, you know, I ain't got to worry about those 22, but that one right there. That little Rick, I'm just playing Rick. Now that little Rick, you got to watch him. You got to remind them all the time. Rule number three, Rick, you got to sit down when you come to class. So the, Paul tells his son of the faith, Timothy, this in First Timothy chapter one, beginning at verse eight. But we know that the law is good. A standard is good. It guides us. It teaches us. It reminds us. It gives us a knowledge of sin. But the law is good if a man use it lawfully. It's great to have a standard. It's, it's even better to have people that abide by the standard. Knowing this, Paul, to Timothy. That the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. They need to be they need to be reminded and held accountable for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. These are some rough folks for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars. For perjured persons. Now, when you, when you sign something under the penalty of perjury, you ever signed that? You ever read that? That means you will not willfully lie. <laughs> I fully, I attest that the following is true under the penalty of perjury. So don't lie and then sign your name. Sign, I just lie, bold faced lie, and sign Gail Nelson. Perjury, by definition, is to willfully tell an untruth. So for perjured persons, people that have just knowingly lied. <laughs> and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So this is why we have the, ne the necessity of the law. 
what is sin. We, we, we'll bring them all up here, if you will. First John 3 and 4, sin is a transgression of the law. We'll keep reminding us. We have to abide by a standard of conduct, an expectation from God. Sin is a violation or transgression of the law. And we recognize that even we as children of God, when we know better, we need to do better. Let me say that again. When we know better, we need to do better. So seasoned children of God, we shouldn't have to focus on some of the fundamental things. That's why the Hebrew writer said, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Why are we teaching seasoned children of God the basic fundamentals? The Bible talks about that. When you need to be teaching, somebody got to remind you of some of the fundamentals. That's why it's good to see children of God here at Miami Gardens doing what we need to do because there are those coming behind us that we got to teach. Therefore, to him to know what to do good, let me move on. And do with it not, what is that? To him it is sin. Expectation. So, and again, that can we could stay right there. That, that's a lesson in terms of seasoned children of God, teaching, mentoring. Doing, setting forth a proper example in our attendance and our punctuality. And again, we want to thank you all again. It's getting better every single week at Miami Gardens. Amen. We say it in love. We're going to keep saying it because we're telling you the truth. We're going to be on time for everything else. Be on time for the Lord. And 15 minutes. And so, being, so being on time is actually late. You ever heard that old school? Dan, you know what I'm talking about. So if you got to be somewhere at 6 o'clock, you're, you're in place before 6. If your class starts at seven o'clock, you're in class before seven. Amen. If your shift starts before when Lyman drove those trucks, you have to be in that truck by seven o'clock. That boy got it revved up at 640. Amen. Country boy had it revved up probably before that. But that's called preparation. And we as children of God, if we know to do good and we do it not to him, it is sin. There's an expectation for us. So let's go ahead and spend the rest of our time. Will a loving God punish us? Will a loving God punish us? We recognize man recognizes accountability. There's accountability with man. And I would say to you, and again, I had a follow-up meeting with some folks with the prison. And get, we're gonna, you're going to be hearing more about that from me and Rick as it relates to, and the deacons, as it relates to a prison ministry. I'm kind of going through as kind of the, the guinea pig, if you will, going through the process, getting screened and all of that. And there's a group of, young, group of grown men that I'm going to teach public speaking in the jail. It moved me that much because they're going to get out and I want them to be ready to speak. And, and, and to do something in society. So man recognizes accountability. So when we ask the basic question, what does the Bible speak about accountability? Well, in Romans chapter 13, revisiting it just for a minute, Romans 13, Paul writing to the church of Christ at Rome, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained, chosen of God. God allows mankind to establish authority. There's a necessity of authority. They are of God. Thank God. Thank God. And we as children of God should be the last people talking about, you know, going against law enforcement, things like that. We go against injustice. We need things to be in order. We pray for peace. When Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, that we may be live praying for kings and those in authority, that we may live a peaceable life. Amen. That's when you think about those public servants, they're officers of the peace. Now, if they raise hell, they need to be held accountable as well. Because they have they have affirmed an oath, if you will, or con confirmation that they will serve the public, public servants. And so it is. Let's stay with it now. So whosoever, verse two, Romans 13. Y'all still there? Whosoever therefore resisted, resisted the power, don't fight against authority. We all have to be subject in every aspect of our lives. Students to teachers, children to parents, employees to employers, saints of God to local leadership, and all mankind to God. You really want to take it even further. You can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and about verse number 1. We recognize that the head of Christ is God. Amen. Christ is God. Man, Christ, and head of woman is man. And so the world have you believe, oh, oh, stop all that. It's about inclusivity now. The Bible still says so. And if a woman doesn't want to be subject to a man, don't get married. All bad by yourself. Just don't act like you're married. Amen, walls and lights. I ain't with him. Okay. All right. Let me move on. Y'all did that to me. 
<laughs> don't resist the power. Whosoever resists, therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God. There it is. There's your connection between practicality and scripture, theology and just practical. If we are unruly people, we are going against God. And let me just, let's go a little deeper now. Because the Bible says in verse number verse number three, the latter part of verse two, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? We got to respect it. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword. There's your punishment. There's the consequence. There's the accountability. He doesn't bear the sword in vain. When you talk about a different level of punishment, a stricter punishment, a harsher punishment, that is not there just to be there. There's something that Rick and I, we, as we dealt in juvenile justice, we called it escalation. The situation escalates itself. If we had sometimes we, we had to put we had to take a kid down, he became a threat to himself, a threat to pop property or a threat to himself, property or to somebody else. Hit one of those three. He's going down. No questions asked. Amen, Daryl. You know. Another you, you're going to threaten somebody else. He's just trying to sit there and eat his lunch. You gonna come in here and threaten everybody in here. We're going to watch you. You become a threat. You're going. We're going to tell you to sit down. We're gonna get, we'll give you the nonverbal first. You know, grandmama's here with nonverbal. We look at you. You want to look back at us with some crazy eyes? Get closer to him. Okay, sit down now. Gave you a nonverbal. Now we gave you a verbal. Sit down. No, 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 no. He made me, and you're getting closer and closer to him. We gave you a nonverbal. We gave you a verbal. Now you're gonna have to feel it. Now you're going down. You're gonna take him, get him out of here. Amen. Some of y'all shook your head, but see, let me tell you something. That's how it goes. That you escalated that thing. And we met you where you are. We let us not be that unruly employee, that unruly student, that unruly Christian. The elders ain't gonna take you down. God will. To be clear. But look at this Bible. What the Bible says. He doesn't bear the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, servant of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. I want to give you a bonus scripture. Go to Romans thirteen. Let's go. Let's take it a little deeper. I got to do this because we didn't hit this this morning. But I want you to understand. Conscience. The reason Christians should be the best employees, the reason we should be the best employees is the very next verse. Romans 13 and 5. We recognize the necessity of authority. We recognize uh, the rule. I mean, those who are in authority, we should be subject to them, obedient. But verse 5, do we? Do we do, do you just do right to avoid jail? The answer as a Christian should be no. There's another reason. Verse five, Romans 13. Y'all there? Wherefore, ye must needs be subject. Who is he? Who's reading? Who's speaking? Paul. To whom is he speaking? The church of Christ at Rome. What's he talking about? Being good dual citizens of this nation, of this world and of the Lord's church. Why? Wherefore, ye church of Christ at Rome must needs be subject not only for wrath. Don't you get punished by the law of the land? but also for conscience sake. Sleep at night knowing we're sitting here lying to our boss, cheating on our boss, not being the kind of citizen we ought to be. So for children of God, dual citizenship, you should know we should be the best employees. They should say we love having Devin on staff. We love having Caraballo on staff. Amen? Insert your name. So the consequences of disobeying God, man was created in God's image. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We recognize that. And God didn't make mistakes when he created us. Amen. But man has the power, the free will, the volition. Volition means the power to choose. You get the word voluntary, volition, ball. We, we make a decision to do it. It's not, it's not just no one's making you do it. So we have power to choose good or evil. We, we, that's not breaking news. So when Joshua challenged Israel in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, he said, choose you this day from your own through your own volition. Make a decision. That's why, again, please encourage and challenge and expect from everybody in your network to be decisive people. We live in a world of indecision. I don't know undecided about that. Undecided in the electoral context. Oh, undecided. Let's go. Let's talk to the undecided. They know what they do. They just want to be on TV. 
please. You know exactly which one. I'm undecided. You're undecided about what? If you're hungry, you understand you need to get something to eat. You're going to eat something. Amen. Make a decision. I'm allergic to hunger. <laughs> Ask Chantel. I turned to a good. If I don't eat a Sunday by two o'clock, things happen. Amen. <laughs> My point is this Joshua said, Choose you this day. You're going to serve. If you're going to serve God, and Joshua gave him some examples. He said, You can serve the gods of the other side of the flood, whom your parents serve. You can, you can serve the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Or as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. You can do what everybody else is doing around you. You can do what your parents did, or you can make a decision yourself and serve God. He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Will can get us in trouble. That's not breaking news, but I wanted to remind us in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. Prophets come to you speaking on behalf of God and you killed them. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often will I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. I was talking to some brothers and sisters after service this morning. And Brother Dadeo, I tell you what, do we understand who we're dealing with? God, all powerful omnipotent, all-knowing, omniscient, ever-present, all pre ever-present, omnipresent. He's everywhere, all-powerful, and all-knowing. And we act like we can outsmart him. And the same God still is, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now, imagine having all power and somebody wrong you. Well, how would you, I would just be like, zap, boom. Sorry, Slocum, yeah, boom, gone, Slocum, gone. Now, what's the rest of y'all going to do? That's what man would do. We serve a loving God. Amen, saints. A long suffering. He does us, and he still pleads with us. And even Jesus, when he was on the earth, had to deal with man's evil intent. In John chapter 5 and verse 18, John 5 and verse 18, then we're going to drop down to verse 39 and through 42, all in John chapter 5. Put them on the screen for you, for, for time's sake and for your convenience, and help in on the lesson. We are created in man in God's image, Genesis 126. We serve a loving, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God who still pleads with us. Does he have to? No, but he is a just God. In John 5 and verse 18, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. The Jews sought to kill Jesus because he not only had broken a Sabbath, but said also that God was his father making himself equal with God. How dare you? Y'all get the context? You're equal with God. God, your father. And by the way, you violated the Sabbath? That's why it's so important in the Lord's church. We got to know scripture. And every, you look, you give me 10 Christians, they may have come out of different circumstances. So there's going to be a sensitivity. We talked about it this morning. We'll talk about it again uh, later on. There's sensitivities. There's different levels of uh, some have a weak conscience. It doesn't make them bad Christians. A hypersensitivity with something. But don't make that just because that's your disposition. Don't impose that on everybody else. Y'all got it? If somebody's like, no, 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 I'm I just I just again, I use eating meat because that's a safe one. But there's other things I have sensitivities to based on where they came from. Show me a child of God who's a former Catholic. They're going to have a lot of sensitivity to anything traditional. Anything. Because that was what it was all about. So we're not going to have a bingo tournament for somebody that came out of Catholicism. Amen? That's a big fundraiser. Because that's a sensitivity. That would, be, that would be offensive. So Jesus said, you know, not only has he violated the Sabbath or broke the Sabbath, healing on the Sabbath day, but he also said that God was his father, make himself equal with God. So what did Jesus say to them? Scripture. John 5 and verse 39 on your screen. Is for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. He said, just search, he said, if you question me, search the scriptures. Now, what did he mean by scripture? He didn't say go to the book of Revelation. You know what the scripture, you want to see what I'm pointing? Search the scripture. He said, now you Jews, check basically the Old Testament. When you see the word scriptures, that's what it's referring to. You go check the prophets. Check, you go back to the Pentateuch, go to the first five books of the Bible. Go to the first verse in the Bible. Take, look back. You're going to question me? 
search the scriptures for they, look at what he says, for in them you think you have eternal life, but in they are they which testify of me. Oh, you know that made them hot. You will try to kill me and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. In the legal, the correctional context known as uh, intent. Jesus knew their intent. Your intent was evil. If you truly wanted to serve God, check the books and you're going to find it comes right to me. And I'm here in your midst. So Jesus had to deal with man's evil intent. And guess what, saints? So do we. Listen, as we talk about judgment, how we react to people, we have to be merciful too, just like God's merciful to us. Amen. Get this. We got to apply this. We want to see mercy's going, mercy suits our case best at judgment. Mercy is not getting true. So we need mercy at judgment. When we say, Lord, have mercy, mean it. But now, when God created us, in Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 29, Lo, this uh, the Solomon, the wise man, the preacher, had this to say. And he's pleased at the 7 and verse 29. We talked about, I think we quoted it this morning, had the brothers read it this morning. I want you to see it. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright. God made us upright. Why is that? Cross-reference that with Genesis 1 and 26. God made man in his own image. So God is an upright God. So when I say cross-reference or mate, you see me doing this with my hands, mate those scriptures. When you study, as, as Rick and I, we study lessons and any gospel preacher, teacher studies lessons, you mate scriptures. This is a perfect mate. Genesis 1, 26, Ecclesiastes 7 and 29. Lord, this only have I found that God hath made man upright, quote unquote, in his image. But they, man, not God, have sought out many inventions. Inventions is something you create. I just want to find my truth. I just want to find my truth. No, the truth is in Christ. It's about your truth. I don't want to have my truth. I want to be in Christ. I believe in God. So you're going to find your heaven? No, God created a place for us. So we be careful. So there was inventions. And when we talk about a new hermeneutic, a new gospel, new and improved. Please, let's hold, to the, let's hold the line. Let's keep studying God's word. So when people go outside of this word, they're going to invent, and they have to invent something. And just because you read it on the Internet, don't make it the gospel truth. Amen, saints. Know the Bible. What did Jesus tell them? Search the scriptures. For in them, you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And so when we talk about inventing things, what separates man from God is our sin. Behold, the land's hand does not shorten, the Lord's hand, excuse me, the Lord's hand does not shorten that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your iniquities, your lawlessness. Iniquity by translation, please get that in your notes because sometimes we just use sin so casually. Sin is the violation. Iniquity is lawlessness. It's a mindset. We act where you act like there is no law. We act like the conduct is there is no authority. I can do whatever I want to do. Iniquity. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins. See how the Messianic prophet, see what he did? You not only violated, but you act like there is no authority, which lead to further violations. It's like having, you know, offense after offense after offense after offense. The first offense is you think you're all of that. Wow. <laughs> you take a look at current events. Nobody is above the law. And any man on this earth, I don't care what your last name is, man or woman, no one is above the law. And saints, may we never walk around acting like that we cannot be held accountable. On your job, be thankful. Be humble. Kids in school, you may have a 6.0 GPA. I don't even know if that's possible, but still be humble. So the Messianic prophet, your iniquities are separated between you and your God and your sins and your violations. Your mindset of lawlessness and your violations from you that he will not hear. And that leads us to the reality of hell. A few more points tonight. The reality of hell. We talk about hell and let's understand. Get this in your notes. I'm going to quiz you on this. Death equals separation. Death means separation. 
We said it this morning. I think I quoted a few scriptures. I want you to see it. See the Sunday night crowd. This is the advanced class. Let me look at y'all. Nobody said amen. Thank you. But this, it's reinforced. When we are, when we were created, Genesis 2 and 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath, that breath by translation is a spirit of life, not the Holy Spirit. If this were the Holy Spirit, then everybody would just have it at birth. No, this is the spirit of life, the breath of life. And man became a what? A living soul. So and God, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, not evolution. Amen. Don't call them apes. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath, the spirit of life. And man became a living soul. Intelligent design requires intelligence and somebody greater than man. Intelligent designer, intelligent design. Thank God. We were formed from the dust of the ground. So when we die, when we die, look at the scripture. Make this. We should know this. Then shall the dust return where? To the earth. I got it. For, to the earth as it was. That's where we came from. The, the, we go, we're going back ashes to ashes and dust to dust. So when, we, when Rick and I have to do have officiate funerals, and we've officiated many of them, we remind people at a time where they are vulnerable, grieving, that we came from the dust. God's creation made in his image, made upright, Ecclesiastes 7 and 29. Then we start creating our own little inventions. Well, you know, I was reading, brother. You know, I was thinking, brother. You know, okay, that's good. It's good to think. But don't think outside of God. Then shall the dust return to earth as it was. Y'all got that part? We're composed of body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. The body goes back to the dust, where it came from. The spirit of life, the breath of life, where does that go? Here it is. And the spirit shall return, small s, not Holy Spirit, the breath of life. And the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Suicide is real. I told you all. Every year I do scholarship interviews. We interview 25 seniors, all of whom are re remarkable kids, ridiculously high GPAs. Out of the 25 kids, 11 of them said they thought about committing suicide during COVID. Almost 50%. And on this Thursday, Lord willing, not far from here in Miami Gardens, I'll call their names and gonna walk across that stage. People in the audience won't know when I give some of them a, a bigger hug than normal. Those are the children that were standing in front of me, sitting in front of me with tears, holding a box of Kleenex that we gave them. They, talk about take, they thought about taking their own life. God gives us life. It's all God's. We, it, we, we would be, it's, it is the, it, not the ultimate sin, but it is a sin to take our own life. And there is no coming back. So the Greek Latin word, S-U-I, means your own, sui. Suicide, you take your own life. So I just wanted to pause here because in the Lord's church, if you have some things you're struggling with and you get to the point of despair and no hope, talk to somebody. Amen. Please. Amen. Saints, we don't know what somebody sitting next to you is going through. They have gone through sitting in a car by themselves, sitting somewhere by themselves. Young lady said she went to the bathroom and she didn't plan on coming back out. But she heard a little cousin knocking on the door. A little cousin kept yelling. I'm going to say it like she said it. Little cousin said, open the door. I got to pee. And she said she couldn't, have, she couldn't handle hearing the pain in her little cousin's voice. And she opened the door. And the reason she went to that bathroom is because her mother was incarcerated. Don't tell me people don't deal with stuff. Saints of God need to hear this. And it's not just, well, God is good all the time. Everything is just fine. Like a robot. No, sir. No, ma'am. If you're hurting, talk to somebody. Say, brother, can I talk to you for a minute? We can go behind closed doors. We can go anywhere. So we can talk and get it off your chest. You may feel alone, but you're never alone with God. I had to give you that commercial break because we just, we just don't know. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. We're going body, soul, and spirit. Get, keep track. Body, back to the dust. Back to the earth from whence it came. Spirit of life, back to God who gave it. That leaves only one thing, our last point tonight. That leaves only one thing, our soul. As we talk about hell, Luke chapter 16, we're going to revisit this a few times. 
when we go when we get into the judgment, probably the lesson number five, sentencing, we're gonna have to come back to this. But in Luke chapter 16, rich man and Lazarus. I got a paraphrase for time. Rich man and Lazarus. Y'all remember? Rich man fared sumptuously every day. He ate well, in other words. He ate very well every day. Beggar was asking for basic crumbs from his table, and the dog came and licked his sword. But let's drop down. But see, death does not discriminate. Death means what? Separation. And it came to pass, Luke 16, beginning at verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. After death, the rich man also died and was buried. So beggar died, struggled physically, rich man died. Comfortable physically. They both, and in hell, he lift up his eyes being in torments. We cannot say that there is no punishment after death. The rich man fared sumptuously, ate well every day. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. I'll make this point tonight. You're going to see it on the screen in the lessons to come. In hell, we are in a conscious state, no longer in the flesh. There's a couple basic points. I'm going to drop them tonight, but we're going to hit it again later on. We're not longer in the body because that went back to the dust. Amen. Spirit of life went back to God. That's why you're dead, because the spirit leaves the body. The, spirit, the body without the spirit is dead. James talked about that. So when the spirit of life goes back to God, we're dead. Amen. So the soul, we're in a conscious state. And this gets into the deepest of theology. They're like, what is it like, brother? And I was like, I ain't never been there. But one thing I do know, what we all can read is he was in a conscious state post-death. Y'all see that? Well, if his body went up there, then what's about his eyes? I can't speak to that. But in a conscious state, he knew where he was. It's not punishment if you don't know where you are. Imagine somebody putting you in jail. You're like, and they say it's jail, but yet you got beaches and palm trees, and you're sitting there eating some shrimp. It's like, oh, this is jail? It's not punishment if you don't feel it. And in hell, I got to hasten on now. I'm going to come. You're going to see this a lot in the weeks to come. Lord willing. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, a place of torment for your notes and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that same beggar, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented, place of torment. In this flame, you put your hand in some fire. Well, don't do you. Don't put your hand in fire. You get a flame as hot. But Abraham said, son, remember that in that that thou, you in thy your life time. That is the time of opportunity. As we study judgment, we got to see judgment is the end. Death, then judgment. Death, physical death precedes judgment. Let us use the most of our life time. We don't know how much time we have. In your lifetime, receive its good, thy good things, and likewise Lazarus' evil things. But now he is comforted. There's a place of comfort. And there's a place of torment. Put that in your notes. As we continue to study the Hadean world, post-death, Christ has not come back yet, but there is a place of torment and there is a distinct place of comfort. Amen, if you understand that. It's right here in the text. So everybody goes to hell. That, that messed people up. Now, I ain't going to hell. Well, where are you going? The Hadean Hades, there's a place of comfort and there's a place of torment. They both were there in two distinct places. Amen. And he's, uh, and you know, the greater punishment, not only are you tormented in the flame, but you can see him. Can, can you send him? Please have mercy on me. And we're going to go further when we have more time. Because Abraham's going to break this thing down that, oh, by the way, there's something between us. And he ain't coming to you. You ain't coming up here. So we, as we close tonight, we are born 
physically into this world. We must be born again to become children of God. We die. So we we are born. We need to be born twice. Nicodemus, how can a man enter his mama's womb into a second mother's womb a second time and be born? No, we're not going back into our mama's womb. We're born again. We obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we have to be born twice, phys physically and spiritually. We're born again. We only want to die once. Physical death. Because the second death in Revelation chapter 20, in verse 14, the Bible describes a penalty of hell as the second death. But you, we don't want to die twice. Amen, saints. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You want to break down that, that lake of fire, Gehenna, the eternal torment? When Christ comes back again, bless you, when Christ comes back again, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. So Hades, a place, it's almost like being in a holding cell awaiting the sentence, but they got fingerprints on you. They got for camera video. You are guilty as charged. You just wait here until final sentence. Best example is being on death row. Oh, you're going to die. Right here. We don't live our life, go to a place of torment, and then somehow make it heaven. See, the li liars and all these folks who are lying on God, well, you got purgatory. Just send us a little money. We're going to pray for them. How, how, how are you going to know they made it? I get a confirmation number? People are lying. People are like, no, I'm, I'm going to keep sending keep sending the Catholic Church money because he's in purgatory and, you know, they're they going to keep praying for him. We're playing with God. Death and hell were cast to the lake of fire. This is the second death. This is the ultimate separation from God. And so as we close, come on, song leader, as we close. On Sunday nights, I tried my cutoff at 7 o'clock. If you all see how I look at my watch, I'm 7.02. I know I can tell time, but 7 o'clock is my cutoff. So as we close, we got to obey the gospel. And people want to make God so benevolent, so benevolent, so loving that he won't even discipline. That makes them unjust. A parent who doesn't discipline their children is not a good parent. There must be a standard. The wise man says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. There has to be discipline. As shepherds, we must discipline. Everything is not everything. Everybody's just God is love. and We go sit down. You got some congregations that are just going buck wild. Absence of leadership. So we thank you all for your cooperation. But we cannot just back down on being in a position because we're going to face a harsher judgment anyway. We'll get to that later. Too much is given, much is required. We got to not only just preach it, we got to live it. When Jesus comes back again, our final thought tonight. Paul writing to the church of Christ at Thessalonica. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. These are comforting words. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Christ is coming back again with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Did y'all catch that? Two froms, separation. It's almost like a stiff arm in football or like your modern day NBA when people push off and create space. Let me say it again. Paul is saying, you, Thess you, you Thessalonians, members of the Lord's church, I know you're going through persecution, but here's some comforting words. Christ is coming back again with his mighty angels. He's coming back from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance. Will a just God punish us? Christ is coming back again. Amen. If you understand that. In flaming fire, taking vengeance. Vengeance doesn't mean at a boy, at a girl. Vengeance means you're about to be punished. Amen. If you understand that. Who do you take vengeance on? On them that know not God. No means you don't have a relationship with God. Atheists, those that say, I don't believe in any God. I just got <clears throat> my own power. I believe in whoever you are. You don't have a relationship with Christ. Taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey, and, and obey not 
the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we say you have to obey the gospel, if you fail to obey the gospel, if you choose not, you choose through your own volition not to obey the gospel, it's vengeance. So will God punish an old disobedient nation, a disobedient people? Yes. Yes. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? How long does everlasting last? It lasts forever. I don't know if you've ever been sick. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? When you start feeling it coming on, then it, you get sick and you start feeling better. Imagine being in eternal torment. From the presence of the Lord, separation depart from me, and from the glory of his power. So tonight we just beg of you, if you're not in the Lord's church, here's yet another opportunity in your lifetime to become a Christian. In your lifetime to become a Christian. Because after we die, please, Lord, please help me, please. Because when you're in a, a position of pain, you're going to ask for help. Remember, in your lifetime, you receive good things and Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And there's more to that. God's plan of salvation, if you're interested, and I hope you are, you must hear and believe the gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. How Jesus Christ died for our sins. How Jesus Christ hung on that cross, shed his blood, and purchased the Lord's church. It is the Lord's church. Church does not belong to man. Anybody that says it's their church, it is theirs. Let them have it. Let them have it. You let them know, okay, that's good. I want to be in the Lord's church. You can have that. Anybody say they got a holy father down here? Let him have it. And when he dies, you have to find another. I got to find another holy father. I'm going to stick with the one. I'm going to stick with the one. I'm going to stick with the one I came with. <laughs> How about that? The one who created us. Lord have mercy. So the gospel, not only did Christ die for us, he shed his blood, purchased the church, purchased the people, and he rose again the third day. You must believe that with all your heart. Be willing to repent, turn from our ways, turn to God. Luke 13, 3 and 5. You got to repent. Acts 15 and 7. Must be willing to confess Christ to be the son of God. Matthew 10, 32, Acts 8, 30, 37. We got to repent and confess. And then upon that confession, you'll be immersed in water, baptized for the remission of your sins. Our sins are washed away. We are born again. That second birth to avoid dying twice. Live faithfully unto death. Because I tell you what, at the end of the day, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you need to respond in any way, please come right now as we together stand. As we together sing, won't you come?